Well, we are engaged in a review of the book of Numbers. And it gets its name from the Greek translation of that in the Septuagint. But the Hebrew name is Bamidbar in the wilderness. And it really records the wilderness wanderings. Of course, as soon as I say that, I realize I'm exaggerating. Because the wilderness wanderings are 38 years, which has a surprising scarcity of detail. A few incidents here and there are recorded for our learning. But it's actually wasted years, and we'll explore some of that. The 38 years from the giving of the law at Sinai to the eve of conquest, when Joshua takes over and they, they head into the land. These 38 years are the wasted years. It took only 40 hours to get Israel out of Egypt. It took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel, to get the world, worldliness behind them. And uh, the chronicle of successes and failures of the wilderness wanderings are recorded, some of them in Exodus, m some of them here in Numbers, some of them summarized in the book of Deuteronomy. Why do, we ha why do we study this? We're New Testament Christians. Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. We should expect to get all kinds of insights from any study of the Scripture, Old Testament or New, but these in the Torah especially, and one of the dangers we face is that we can get so entangled with the little rules and details that we miss the real point, and especially as that point applies to our lives. So I'm going to try not to get into how many pounds of flour or drops of oil were in which offerings. There's a place to do that. And if, you're, if, you're, if the Lord leads you in that direction, I encourage you to undertake a study of the book of Leviticus, which goes at that quite systematically. It's the only book on holiness in the Bible. And, uh, but uh, we'll try to take a little different cut at this to try to understand what the lessons are for us. The word examples in the Greek is tupos, which, from which we get the, ter the word type, like prototype. And uh, that's a figure or an image, a pattern, a prefiguring. An engineer makes a prototype to see what the final thing will probably look like, that sort of thing. And uh, that the word type in biblical literature refers to a, a uh, perspective that is gained from an incident about something in the future. And there's some very dramatic examples which clearly are engineered deliberately by the Holy Spirit in the text. So you want to be sensitive to those. One of the things we learned in the previous chapters was the order of march. We had Moses and Aaron, then the camp of Judah, then the two families, the Levites, then the camp of Reuben, then the third, the final, the Kohathites. And anyway, we have the four camps of Israel, the camp of Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan, each one of three tribes each. And we discovered they are assembled by trumpets. And how many trumpets are there? Seven. And that's an interesting preamble when you study Revelation chapter 8. We also talked about manna the strange material that fed them thir during that 38 years. Little thin flakes that were white, or almost white, and um, tasted uh, like uh, uh, something made with olive oil. And um, a couple of quarts of that were kept near or in, there's a big rabbinical debate, was it in the Ark of the Covenant or just in front? I won't get into that here. They were memorialized for some time. And, uh, but when they finally get to Gilgal, just before Joshua takes them in the land, the manna ceases. It was a special provision for their wilderness wanderings. And so it's interesting, even though they're in rebellion, even though they are in, in, in uh, disbelief, God is still providing for them. In the days of Esther, God is very invisible and yet providing. We need to understand that. So the, the next uh, handful of chapters we looked at last time was the quailing the rebellion, the quails and all that, Miriam's uh, murmuring. They murmur. How many times do you think? Good guess, seven, right on. We talked about at some length the intelligence mission, the sending in of 12 spies, and uh, obviously, and, and the result of the, the reports, the banishment. Because of those 12 tribes, only 10 earned their pay, so to speak. Caleb and the one that was named, renamed Joshua by Moses, um, they gave the good report. And because they did, they were the only survivors. The other 10 were killed on the spot later, I mean shortly after, but on the spot. And the entire generation that failed to take advantage of the opportunity, uh, arguing that they were, that Moses just brought them out there to die in the desert. He says, no, you got it backwards. Your kids are going to 
go in the promised land. You guys are going to die in the desert. And that entire generation passed away. And when the last of them pass away, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, that's when they enter the land. And that the 38 years are wasted years. But uh, this brings us to tonight's session, chapters 15 to 20. The journey, having failed at Kadesh Barnea, they were, had the opportunity to go in, and they wouldn't take it. Then when God closes the door, they have the presumption to try to go in anyway, and they get clobbered. You know, that's as bad as the first. You know, it's amazing how many of us probably have occasions where we have a lack of faith on the one hand, and we counter that then with acting on our own presumption rather than God's leading. There, you can err both ways. Not responding in faith to the opportunity when God calls, and presuming an opportunity of our own flesh, not of God's making. And that's our challenge, is to understand what's really happening. So we could call this faltering, fumbling, and fussing through the wilderness, as, as uh, the 38 years might be labeled. These are wasted years without much recorded. A few incidents, and we'll focus on a few of those incidences. It's interesting, we'll discover when you get to Joshua 5, they didn't even circumcise during those 38 years. First thing Joshua has to do is get the whole nation, a couple of million people, the males, circumcised. They didn't practice. The basic, one of the basic rites or practices of Judaism, they failed to do during the 38 years. They repair that, of course, at Gilgal. Joshua does that. They did not undertake the offerings. We'll find all these details about the offerings. If you look at the language carefully, you'll discover when you get in the land, you'll do this, that, and the other thing. They didn't do that. They didn't, they didn't offer. Amos chapter 5 deals with that. In fact, they went the other way. They worshipped idols. And that's not my conjecture. Amos hammers away at that in Amos 5, and it's also alluded to in Acts 7 by Stephen in the summary of this period. See, we too, you and I, we're also strangers, pilgrims, wandering in the wilderness. We are not citizens of this world. The book of Revelation makes a distinction. One of the groups in the book of Revelation are the earth dwellers. And that term doesn't just mean they're physically on the earth. It means they dwell upon the earth. They are in, in uh, distinction of the, the believers. We are not earth dwellers. We should have a light touch on this world. We're passing through. So we have... Lots to learn by watching the, the, the confrontations that occur um, throughout the book of Numbers. So let's jump in. Our, our session starts now with uh, Numbers 15, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land of your habitations, which I give unto you, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, or a sacrifice, and performing a vow, or a free will offering, or in your solemn feast, to make a sweet savor unto the Lord, of the herd or of the flock, then shall he that offereth his offering unto the Lord bring me a meat offering of a tenth deal of flour uh, mingled with a fourth part of a hen of oil and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering shalt thou prepare with a burnt offering or sacrifice for one lamb or for a ram that thou shalt prepare for a meat offering two tenth deals of flour mingled with a third part of a hen of oil. And for a drink offering thou shalt offer the third part of a hin of wine for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And when thou preparest a bullock for a burnt offering, or a for a sacrifice performing a vow, or peace offering unto the Lord, then shall he bring forth a bullock, a meat offering of three-tenth deals of flour mingled with half a hin of oil. We could spend a lot of time talking about the distinctions of these. There's some slight differences and some supplements to the book of Leviticus. I'm not going to spend time on that. We've got plenty of other material to cover here. But I do encourage you uh, to to get a background on the various offerings, what kinds, there's five basic different types uh, in the book of Leviticus and how this works. But this continues with these instructions, thou shalt bring for a drink, a drink offering half a hin of wine. A hin uh, is about, uh, um, I've forgotten now, uh, a quart, I think, either a quart or a fraction of a quart. Uh, thou shalt bring uh, for a drink offering half a hin of wine, and for an offering made by fire a sweet savor unto the Lord. Thus shall it be done for one bullock, or for a ram, or for a lamb, or a kid, according to the number that ye shall prepare. So shall ye do every one according to their number. The only thing I really want to, uh, we're obviously not going to remember or get into all the details, but it's interesting that God is very specific as to what he expects. Um, so often we sort of assume that what sounds good to us may sound good to him. And, you know, it'd be better if we did it the other way around. Better if we find out his buying habits, might understand what he likes. Um, and, and uh, respond accordingly. All that are born of the country shall do these things after this manner in an offering uh, and, 
in offering and offering made by fire of a sweet savor in the Lord. And if a stranger sojourn with you, or whosoever be among you in your generations, and will offer an offering made by fire of a sweet uh, savor unto the Lord, as ye do, so he shall do. It's interesting that they did allow strangers, foreigners, to travel with them, but if they did, they expected them to conform to their practices, not the other way around. We sort of get that backwards, don't we? One ordinance shall be both for you and of the congregation, and also for the stranger that sojourneth with you. An ordinance forever in your generations. As ye are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. That's an interesting instruction. One law and one manner shall be for you and for the stranger that sojourneth with you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land whither I bring you, then it shall be that when ye eat of the bread of the land, ye shall offer up a heave offering unto the Lord. Now a heave offering is like, or a wave offering is, you understand what happens to that after it's waved in the direction of the tabernacle, it belongs to the Levites. And one-tenth of what the Levites get go to the priests. So this was, so the, the, it was still useful. It wasn't burned to, it wasn't burned to ashes. It was, it was an offering that, for the, for the uh, people involved. So you shall offer up a cake of the first of your dough for a heave offering. And, and as ye do the heave offering of the threshing floor, so shall ye heave it. And the first of your dough shall ye give unto the Lord a heave offering in your generations. And if ye have erred and have not observed all these commandments which the Lord hath spoken unto Moses, even all that the Lord hath commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day that the Lord commanded Moses and henceforth among your generations, then it shall be, if aught be committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord with his meat offering and his drink offering according to the manner of one kid uh, of the goats for a sin offering. We're dealing here with sins of ignorance. They're not ignored. They still need to be paid for because they're still sin. Men are not lost because they haven't heard the gospel. They're lost because they're sinners. Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. We need to understand that. Being lost is our natural state. That's our genetic inheritance from Adam. And uh, man, mankind is not uh, uh, sitting down in grief today because they haven't heard the gospel. In fact, they're not even anxious to hear it. The gospel's there to repair their fallen state, but the fallen state's a given. You need to understand that. And that's part of what undergirds all of this here. And the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it, is, for it is ignorance. And they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their ignorance. And shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel, and the stranger that sojourneth among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. Now if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly, when he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord, to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. Again, this is partly, in t part of it is to teach that the, 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 the base condition we're dealing with. You shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Because he hath despised the word of the Lord, he hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off, his iniquity shall be born upon him. And, uh, and while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses, to Aaron, and to all the congregation. We're going to see that they kill him. This is very severe. For what? Gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. No, that's not the point. The point, he's presumptuously doing it in defiance of God's direct commandment. And uh, uh, some feel, people feel this is very, very severe. We always forget that the Sabbath laws were also embroidered by the Pharisees that Jesus spoke against. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And uh, the, the Pharisees added uh, these Jewish regulations uh, to, to, uh, that are not contained in the Old Testament uh, to provide their own loopholes for themselves. And uh, the Lord of the Sabbath teaches that the law is designed for man's spiritual enjoyment and to satisfy his deepest needs. The Sabbath was designed for our spiritual growth, not to keep a lot of rules and regulations. 
But the Bible nowhere makes light of, uh, takes a light attitude of, uh, towards the deliberate transgression of any of God's laws. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. The death penalty was the penalty for breaking any of the Ten Commandments. And uh, we need to understand this because it tells us what it means that Jesus Christ died in our behalf. Someone had to die to pay for our sin. And that's part of the teaching that's going on. Someone would say, Jesus, isn't that pretty severe for the guy? No, it's a way of sparing thousands of others that would learn by that that God takes these things seriously. That coin has two sides. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. So that's uh, a tradition that has, is very, very deep. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord. It's like a string around the, the, the nation of Israel's finger. You ever do that? That's probably an old-fashioned thing, to tie a string around your finger to remind you of something. What was that supposed to remind me of? I forgot that. Anyway, but the same kind of idea. This is to remind them, to remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them. And that seek not after your own heart, after your own eyes, after, after which you used to go a-whoring. That ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. That is set aside to your God. I am your, the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. To be holy. You know, glib phrase. What does it really mean? It means to be separate, to be set apart. It's interesting how many churches try so hard to be part of the world. They got it backwards. They got it backwards. Uh, not that they should be just obnoxious, but the point, the concept is to be separated from things of the world, not, not married to them. But I want to talk a little bit, to understand these fringes, you want to understand a basic biblical understanding of what hems are all about. Um, in Hebrew, the term can be is shoal, um, and uh, it's a hem, a border, a fringe, the bottom edge of a skirt or a train. You and I take those for granted, but we tend to embroider rank on the sleeve, like stripes of an admiral, or on the shoulder of, a, of other different ranks. We, we, we carry um, rank in other ways. But in the ancient cultures, they did it on the fringe of their garments. In ancient Mesopotamia, to cut off the hem was to strip someone of their personality, authority, and so forth. It was an expression of stripping you of what you really are to cut off your hem. Because the hem, a husband could divorce his wife by cutting off the hem of a robe. A nobleman would authenticate his contract on a, in a clay tablet by pressing his unique embroidery into that tablet because he, he had an embroidery on his hem that would be representative of his clan, his family, or whatever. And uh, now we find God's covenant with Israel is expressed this way in Isaiah 6, the vision of the throne of God. Where God says, I'm going to spread my skirt over you. Meaning, I'm going to put my authority and protection over you. Same expressions in Ezekiel 16 and also in Ezekiel 39. David is in a cave, and, and uh, hiding in a cave, and Saul inadvertently picks that cave to sleep in overnight. So David realizes he's got an opportunity here, but he doesn't take advantage of it in killing Solomon, uh, uh, killing Saul, excuse me. He doesn't take advantage of that by... Uh, killing Saul, what he does, he cuts off the hem of his garment so he can prove later that he was there. The next day when Saul's down the valley, David's on the mountain says, proving that he could have killed him, showing David's uh, uh, grace in this issue. Later, David is even grieved there because he, re he also feels he had no right to cut off the hem of the king. Even that was an injustice in David's mind to Saul. Ruth in, his, in the climactic scene in Ruth 3, where she asks Boaz to spread his skirt over her. Many people misunderstand verse 9 of chapter 3 as that she's propositioning for sex. No, no, it's worse than that. She's asking him to take her on as a, as a wife. And he understands that it's flattered by it, and then, of course, get into the whole thing. But the point is, the whole, that whole idea of spreading his skirt, Boaz being the kinsman redeemer, to, to spread his authority over her, to take her as a Leverite uh, bride and so forth. The Lord's hymn 
is sought for healing in Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 8, a number of places. In fact, there's one case where the woman that had the issue of blood is crowded through, wants to touch the hem of his garment and uh, d does so in Mark 9 and, and Matthew 9, I should say, and Mark 5. And of course, this also it, it all echoes the significance of the fringes with the blue to remind them of their, uh, of their uh, covenant heritage. Well, let's, let's, the next few chapters uh, go into the priesthood. And we have the gainsaying of Korah. Um, this is mentioned, by the way, in Jude 11 in the New Testament as one of the marks of false teachers in the last days. So as we read this strange story of Korah, who leads this rebellion against Moses and Aaron, let's recognize that the New Testament expressly links our lives to this story because it, it's indicative of the false teachers in the last days. And uh, um, we see forthcoming here a rebellion against um, Moses by Korah on the Levitical side and uh, Reuben and his co cohorts on the civil side. It's, there's two groups that have different agendas, but they're both united in trying, feeling that they've been disenfranchised by uh, Moses' uh, presuming authority here. They're all ignoring the fact that God rather dramatically uh, established them in their position. So, uh, by the way, Korah was evidently a, a cousin of Moses, uh, which makes the rebellion even more serious. But uh, Korah, the son of Esar, the son of Koath, the son of Le uh, Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. In other words, this other group of conspirators are of the tribe of Reuben. The Reubenites were probably upset because they were the first, Reuben was the firstborn, but he lost the franchise because of, he, he, was, he, he will uh, uh, be upstaged. That's where Judah takes over. But they rose up against Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation of So we've got 250 guys that have joined this rebellion against Moses and Aaron. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? You know, this is a false accusation. Moses didn't want the job, if you may recall. And uh, uh, so on. So we've got a... There is a proverb that's meaningful here. It's one of the useful ones to keep in mind. Proverbs 13.10 says that only by pride cometh contention. Whenever you see contention of whatever kind, pride is at the root of it. In this case, it's, I'm sure jealousy is a major part of it. And uh, uh, there are a few complications in the background I won't spend a lot of time on, but... Uh, um, uh, Izar, which is the brother of uh, Amram, is the second son of Koath, and for some reason unrecorded, um, he was he was supplanted by a descendant of the fourth son of Koath, uh, who was appo appointed a, ch a chief or prince of the Koathites. This is all in uh, back in Numbers chapter three, by the way. But anyway, um, discontent with the precedent of having someone younger, a younger relative, uh, uh, you know, originating a, a, a getting in a better uh, situation, may have been one of the reasons he participated in this uh, seditious movement. Um, but anyway, when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face, and he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show you who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. And uh, so the people that are taking too much on themselves are Korah and his gang. Got it backwards. They're causing division. So God's going to show them how you really divide. <laughs> and uh, now the murmuring isn't really against Moses, it's against God, because God is the authority for Moses' authority. And uh, I'm, I'm always reminded by Psalm 105 15, where the scripture is, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Reminds me, many years ago, I was uh, in a, uh, asked to mediate a uh, angry dispute between two partners. Well, actually, there are three partners. Hal Lindsey was in partnership with two other gentlemen. And the two other gentlemen started to have a war between the two of them. Hal, Hal asked me to step in and see what we could do. And, 
And uh, uh, the one guy that was quite aggressive, I just I uh, threw my Bible on the conference table and says, I quoted Psalm 100. He said, you, you will acknowledge that Hal's anointed by God, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me read to you Psalm 105, 15. Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophet no harm. So we recommend that we cut the venture in half and give half to each partner. Um, the aggressive partner later got sold off to somebody. I've forgotten how that all went. The other half was by Bob Hawkins, who became a Harvest House. That's, I often point out I was the midwife that birthed Harvest House many years ago. But whenever I see uh, this kind of situation, I always think of Psalm 105.15. And uh, it's also repeated in First Chronicles 15.22, but Psalm 105.15 is easy to remember somehow. Anyway. Anyway, serious problems require serious responses. So watch out, Cora. This do. Take you censors. That's a you know, holder of fire uh, incense. All his, uh, take you censors, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be cho holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of the Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also, for which cause both you and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? And Moma said to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said that we will not come. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey and to kill us in the wilderness, except thou makest thyself altogether a prince over us? Again, this is a false charge. They were where they chose to be. If they'd followed Moses, they'd be in the land with milk and honey. The reason they're not in the land is they chose not to. This whole thing is, it's, it's, it's astonishing. Even today in our media, to watch accusations that are absolutely inverted, absolutely upside down, absolutely upside down. And, uh, just, and, and major media ganging up with falsehoods. We witnessed recently four of the five major media deliberately presenting knowingly false information in an attempt to unseat a sitting president during time of war. That's called treason. Now, we live in a world where the, the inversions are astonishing. We look at, our, we have a war against terror, but why aren't we defending Israel against terror? And we could go on and on. But uh, anyway, let's move on here. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Moses was very wroth, and I can understand why. <laughs> and said unto the Lord, We respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. In other words, he didn't, get, he didn't take any benefit by his, the burden of his responsibility. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron, tomorrow. And take every man his censer, and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, two hundred and fifty censers. Thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. They took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle, the congregation, with Moses and Aaron. Stand by. <laughs> and Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the floor of the tabernacle of the congregation. The glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. That should have got their attention. And the Lord spake unto Moses and said unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I, that I may consume them in a moment. Woo! can't imagine deliberately trying to make God angry. can't imagine. And yet, and they fell upon their face and said, O God, O God of spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin? Wilt thou, wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? Notice who's going to the defense. The accused. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speaking unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of, 
of uh, the tents. In other words, don't confuse tabernacle with the tabernacle. They're talking about their tents. Um, of Korah, Dathan, and Byron on every side. And Dathan and Byron came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die in common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open up her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. I think that would express it pretty well. It came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that guess what happened? That the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained to Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. These people were sowing division, they got division. God judges the same way in which man sins. That was true of Jacob, it's true of David, true of Paul, the apostle, and it's true of you and me. And all Israel that were round about them, fled at the cry of them. Boy, I can imagine. <laughs> Where they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. So the leadership got sucked into the ground. The other followers got consumed by fire. Rather dramatic day. I won't take the time in order to cover other material, but you might put in your notes Second Peter chapter 2. Verses 10 through 22, which tells you what God's view is of those who despise authority and rebel against God's truth. For most of you, it's probably pretty basic material. On the other hand, I encourage you to refresh your memories with 2 Peter 2, 10 through 22. But in the interest of covering the material, we'll keep moving here. It's at this point, by the way, that the Hebrew Bible starts a new chapter. There are a few places where the Hebrew Bible and our English translations are slightly different. And uh, not a big deal, but just be aware of it. The Jewish scribes felt that the rest of chapter 16 and all of 17 were a unit on the theme of Aaron's unique role as a priest. Continuing in number 16, verse 36. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. And the censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar. And they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hallowed. They shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. They took these censers and flattened them. And they made them, they used them as covering for the brazen altar. There's a brazen altar. They had a, it was on a platform. They covered it because uh, it, it was bronze and they could sit down in the heat. But then secondly, uh, that would also be a reminder of this whole event. Every time they went to the prison halls, they'd remember that these, these were, were of the censors, of, of the, the rebellious ones. And Eliezer the priest took the brazen censors wherewith they were burnt and offered and made broad plates for a covering of the altar to be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron came near to offer incense before the Lord that he be not as Korah and his company as the Lord had said to him by the hand of Moses. But on the morrow, the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. Can you believe this? Is the, by the way, this is the sixth murmuring. I haven't bothered to count them as we go, but you can check it out. This is the sixth murmuring that's recorded as such. And uh, this is on the next day. People are murmuring against Moses because of his brutal treatment of these, re these rebellious people. Ye have killed the people of the Lord. <laughs> Well, it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and behold, the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. The Lord spake unto Moses saying, Get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. <laughs> and they fell upon their faces. Now, 
This crowd is now murmuring against Moses and Aaron, but I want you to notice who goes to bat for the crowd. Moses and Aaron, take a censer, put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. This is Moses' 911 call. Tells Aaron, grab a censer, get to it, to, to intervene on behalf of the people. The plague's already begun. And Aaron took, Moses, took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. Behold, the plague was begun among the people, and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Who is he a type of? Jesus. Who's our high priest? Whoever liveth to make intercession for who? You and me. That's his full-time job. This is a model in a sense. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah. So when you add it all together, it's about 15,000 people. That's a non-trivial episode. And Aaron returned unto Moses under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. Whew. Okay. Now in chapter 17, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take every one of them a rod, according to the house of their fathers, and all of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, write thou every man's name upon his rod. Understand these rods. These are staffs. They're, probably, they're old dead sticks, probably carved with initials or insignias. Or, they're decorated poles that they used as staffs, okay? They're dead. They're old sticks. I don't know how big they were, but they're, you can imagine. You got 12 of them, one for each of the tribes. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom. You got to be kidding. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And, Mo and Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, for each prince one, according to their father's houses, even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among the rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the taber na tabernacle of witness. It came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and brought, bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. And Moses says, this bud is for you, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. All right. <laughs> Forgive me for that. That's Bob Cornuke's favorite line. I had to work it in. And Moses brought out all the... <laughs> but can you picture this, though? Can you imagine? Overnight... Overnight, this thing, this dead stick turns into an almond tree, bearing fruit and blossom. I mean, <laughs> Moses brought out all the rods from before the, uh, before the Lord unto the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. And uh, in Hebrews, the epistle to Hebrews, chapter 4, it makes reference to this. It says, seeing, them that we ha seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when we speak of this co confirmation of Aaron, let's also recognize that we have confirmation the same way. What confirmed Aaron's authority? The dead brought to life. That that rod, which was dead, blossomed, brought forth fruit. It was a resurrection, admittedly in the botanical world, but it was a resurrection that confirmed Aaron's priesthood by God himself. And I suggest to you that's the same way that our priest is confirmed by an empty tomb on Sunday morning. But this man, uh, Hebrews continues a few chapters later, says, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, and wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The writer of Hebrews is making the point that the Levitical priests died. They would disappear. The priest we have never will. 
He ever lives to make intercession for you and I. That's his full-time job. Man, that's great. For such, a high priest, for, for such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, uh, to offer up sacrifice, first of his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Done deal. To tell us die. Paid in full. It is finished. Number 17, verse 10, continuing, The Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. And Moses did so, and the Lord commanded him, so did he. And children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed by dying? Well, we're going to talk about the priesthood. Aaron's been confirmed. Let's start with the whole priesthood. That's chapter 18. The Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy son and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And thou and thy son shall bear, sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi and the tribe of thy father bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee. But thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. So again, this is confirming the... the, the uh, descendants of Aaron in their roles. And they shall keep thy charge and the charge of all the tabernacle. Only they shall not come nigh the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar, that neither they nor ye also die. They shall be joined unto thee. They'll keep the charge of the tabernacle with the congregation for all the service of the tabernacle. And a stranger shall not come nigh unto you. And ye shall keep charge of the sanctuary, the charge of the altar, that there be no wrath any more upon the children of Israel. For I, behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To, the, to you they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Therefore thou and thy son shall keep, shall, with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar uh, and within the veil. And ye shall serve, and I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of, a service of gift. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. The Lord spake unto Aaron, Behold, I also have given thee the charge of my heave offerings of all hallowed things of the children of Israel. Unto thee have I given them by reason of the anointing, and to thy sons by an ordinance forever. This shall be thine of the ho most holy things reserved from fire. Every oblation of theirs, every meat offering of theirs, and every sin offering of theirs, and every trespass offering of theirs, which they shall render unto me, shall be most holy for thee and for thy sons. In the most holy place thou shalt eat it, every male shall eat it, and it shall be holy unto thee. And this is thine, the heave offering of the gift, and all the wave offerings of the children of Israel, and I have given them unto thee, to thy sons and thy daughters with thee, by a statute forever. Every one that is clean in thy house shall eat of it, all the best of the oil, all the best of the wine, and of the wheat, and of the first fruits of them which shall offer unto the Lord, them have I given thee. Whatsoever is first ripe in the land, which they shall bring unto the Lord, shall be thine. Every one that is clean in thy house shall eat of it. Everything devoted in Israel shall be thine. And everything that openeth the matrix in all the flesh which they bring unto the Lord, whether it be of men or beasts, shall be thine. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man shalt thou surely redeem, and the firstlings of unclean beasts thou shalt, not, uh, shalt thou redeem. And those that are redeemed from a month old shalt thou redeem according to the rest of thine estimation for the money of five shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, which is twenty gerahs. But the first thing of a cow, the first thing of a sheep, the first thing of a goat, thou shalt not redeem. They are holy. Thou shalt sprinkle their blood upon the altar, and thou sh shalt burn their fat for an offering made by fire for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the f flesh of them shall be thine, as the wave beast and the right shoulder are thine. One of the things, without getting into all the details here, it's clear that the best is what you bring to the Lord. The best. Not the leftovers. The best. And uh, let your own conscience guide you in that. But clearly, um, you show your devotion, your respect, your awe of God by the prioritization of your life and the, pri and the priorities that lead to your uh, offerings to Him. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the Lord have I given thee, thy sons and thy daughters, with thee by statute forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. Covenant of salt, salt because it was associated with uh, permanence. It was an idiom of, of, a, of a, a serious commitment. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them, for I am thy part and thy inheritance among the children of Israel. When they get into the land ultimately, 
And when they conquer the land and they divide the land, the Levites don't get inheritance. All the other tribes get inheritance. They get a, 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 a geographic area that's theirs. The Levites did not. They got 48 cities scattered throughout, six of which were cities of refuge and so on, but they did not have title to property. They depended upon the donations of the people for the Levites, and the Levites in turn uh, to the priests and so forth. Behold, I have given the children of Levi the t all the tenth of Israel for inheritance for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Neither must the, must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the t tabernacle of the congregation, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. Uh, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord, I have given unto the Le Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, Among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up a heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And this is your heave offering that shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor, and as the fullness of the winepress. Thus ye shall offer a heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel, and ye shall give thereof to the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. So you see the hierarchy. The congregation gives to the Levites, the Levites give to the priests. Understand the priests, not all Levites were priests. All priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Levites in general get the tithes of people, and they then tithe what they have to the priests. Out of all your gifts ye shall offer every heave offering of the Lord, of all the best thereof, even the hallowed part thereof, out of it. All the best thereof. You could just circle that passage, and that covers this whole chapter. The best thereof, whatever it might be. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, When ye have heaved the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the thrashing floor, as the increase of the winepress. And ye shall... Eat it in every place, ye and your households, for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation. Ye shall bear no sin by reason of it, when ye have heaved from it the best of it. Neither shall ye pollute the holy things of the children of Israel, lest ye die. Now we get to chapter 19, which among other things has this strange uh, thing, the red heifer. You hear more speculations that derive from the practices associated with the red heifer. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law, which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot. And there are just all kinds of books being written and so forth as the rabbis try to decide to try to find a heifer that will qualify as the red heifer to indulge in this practice. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. So this is a heifer that's never been used for any other purpose. And you shall give her unto Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp, outside the camp that is, and one shall slay her before his face. Okay. And Eleazar the priest shall take of her blood with his finger, and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times, linking it it's symbolically, of course, to the tabernacle, even though it's outside the camp. One shall burn the heifer in his sight. Her skin and her flesh and her blood with her dung shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. And the priest shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterward he shall come into the camp, and the priest shall be unclean until even. And he she that burneth her shall wash his clothes in water, and bathe his flesh in water, and shall be unclean until the evening. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the red pepper, and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel, for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes, and be unclean until even. And it shall be unto the children of Israel and unto the stranger that sojourneth among them for a statute forever. Interesting. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with it on the third day, and on the seventh day he shall be clean. 
but he, if he purifieth not himself the third day, then on the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead, and purifieth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel, because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him, he shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. This is the law when a man dieth in a tent. All that come into the tent and all that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. Every vessel which hath no covering bound upon it is unclean. Whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person they shall take of the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for sin, and running water shall be put there into in, in a vessel. And a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it on the tent and upon the vessels and upon the persons that were there and upon him that touched a bone or slain or one dead or a grave. The clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day he shall purify himself, wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and he shall be clean at evening. So this is the purification procedure for someone that has become unclean by in some way tainted uh, by coming in touch with death. Okay. But the, man that shall, but the man that shall be unclean shall not purify himself. That soul shall be cut off from among the, the congregation because he hath defiled the, uh, uh, the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. And it shall be a perpetual statute unto them that he sprinkleth the water of the separation shall wash his clothes. That he that toucheth the water of separation shall be unclean until even. And whatsoever the unclean person toucheth shall be unclean. The soul that toucheth shall be unclean till even. Now, um, so this is the whole thing. The red heifer was selected outside the camp, offered, burned, and the ashes then are used with water to be a purification procedure for all these different conditions. Now, you can understand this probably in terms of while they're wilderness wanderings, they have now a procedure that they can use when someone, you've got several million people, and you've got bereavements, you've got funerals, you've got other things. There are all kinds of people that become ritually unclean that need to be purified. There's a, now a procedure that can be administered by, by others of the priests, not necessarily the high priest, um, to deal with this. Now, after the wilderness wanderings, when they enter the land, they're faced with a, even a more complicated problem. They're going to inherit cities spread over the whole country. If somebody is up in Galilee and needs to be purified, he may not, may not be practical for him to get down to Jerusalem, to the temple, to receive purification, you know, from headquarters. What he did was, there was, a, he, he would, there was available to him uh, Levitically, water that came from the red heifer in, uh, in, uh, for purification. One of the places you run into this in the New Testament is in John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, you get through John 1, the big introduction to the fabulous gospel, and then it says, on the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and it goes on. Well, wait a minute, third day from what? If you're reading John 1, there's no reference point here. The third day sounds like it's the third day from something. No, what the third day is, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. You say, why is there a wedding on Tuesdays? Because Jewish weddings are always on a Tuesday. Do you know why Jewish weddings are on a Tuesday? Because of Genesis chapter 1. If you look carefully at the creation, every day of creation... God does this, that, or the other thing, and saw that it was good. On Monday, you'll find there was no such statement. What he does on Monday, he does. It isn't until the next day that he blesses that, does something else, and blesses it too. So Tuesday is distinctive of the seven days in that it's the only, it, 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 it has two blessings, not one. So Tuesday is known to the Jewish mind as the day of double blessing. So if you're going to get married, you do it on Tuesdays. So you'll discover Jewish weddings are on Tuesdays because of this. And so this is what's happening here. On the third day, that is Tuesday, there was a marriage in the Con of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was called his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to them, they have no wine. And you, know, you all know the story, but what many people miss, you get down to verse 6, and there was set there six water pots of stone, 
after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So these, they were obviously in the home of a priest. These were filled with water that had in it, at least technically, uh, ashes of the red heifer. So it could be used for ritual cleansing. Now, Jesus says to the, the servants, fill the water pots with water. In other words, they may have been not full, all the way full. Top them off, fill them to the brim. And then they distribute that as wine. Now, what's kind of interesting about this, first of all, the wedding guests didn't know anything about this. The, the, things went, it was situation normal, except the best wine was coming last. That's kind of neat. They make that remark. Nobody knew what had happened here except the disciples and the servants probably because they recognized what was going on. That was, it was an inside thing. It was not a, a public spectacle. But what was Jesus doing? Turning water into wine, yes. But what water was he using? From their point of view, the ritualistically sacred water. He was Lord of the Torah. Lord, not just Lord of heaven and earth of the Torah, of, the, of these practices. And uh, so there's a whole other undercurrent here. I'll let you dig out on your own. We're going to get to chapter 20 to get a photo finish here. Chapter 20 is now at the end of the 37 years. What you have seen so far, there's obviously been a lot of rules and regulations are embedded in that. Yeah, I understand. But a few incidents out of 37 years. We're not quite finished, but we're at Kadesh again after 37 years. We're now going to encounter the seventh murmuring, believe it or not. And this is going to lead to water being co coming out of a rock. And as a result of the way Moses handled this, he blows it. We want to understand what's going on here. And then we have Edom refusing passage, and that'll finish up, and, and then Aaron finally dies, and that wraps up chapter 20. So let's get back to Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. That Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now we could spend a lot of time talking a little bit about Miriam. She gets a bad rap here because she was murmuring, but she also uh, had some, she, she took care of Moses when he was a baby. Remember, she was older than he was, obviously. And she had her moments. But in any case, she passes away. And there was no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. The people chode, uh, chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren had died before the Lord. Now, of course, they didn't mean it. How often, how often do we all do that? Say something we really don't mean. But there they are again, wishing they had died. Not really. Why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? Hey, you're there because you chose to be there, gang. Wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. The Lord spake with Moses, saying, Take the rod. Notice what God says very carefully. Take the rod. Gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron, thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, and he commanded them. Now, what we really should do if we had the time, but you can do it on your own, you can go to Exodus 17. And you will remember, of course, there was an incident like this very early in the proceedings. At, uh, literally at Sinai, virtually at Sinai. And there again, the people were without water. They were upset. God tells Moses to take your rod and strike the rock, which he does. The rock splits open and a gush comes out. They found that rock, by the way. I didn't have time to dig out the pictures. I was going to show thrown it in here. Uh, they found the rock. And it, it, it's one of the supporting evidences that the real Mount Sinai is not in the Sinai Peninsula. That's a legend that comes from tradition. The real Mount Sinai is exactly where Paul said it was in the book of Galatians. It's in Arabia, in that north northwestern corner of Arabia called Midian. And it's Jabal al-Laws. And there's a lot of uh, um, 
uh, evidence of that. There's quite a story about that. You can dig into that. But among the things, they found the rock. It's a very impressive isolated pinnacle that is split. And in front of it, there's huge evidence of erosion, water erosion, out in the desert. It's really quite dramatic. It's one of the more... Cons they found over a dozen corroborating evidences that seem to indicate that that really is the, the real Mount Sinai. And there's a lot of books about that. You can check into it. But the point is... This event that we're seeing here had occurred a few decades ago, very obviously familiar in the memories of the people, and uh, where the water came out of the rock. But here, God tells Moses his instructions are slightly different in detail. He doesn't tell him to strike the rock. He says, speak to the rock. You say, well, that's splitting hairs. No, it's splitting rocks, but we'll go on here. Okay. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, and as he commanded him, and uh, before we go on, I want to call your attention to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. This is, of course, talking about the Exodus. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? Did all, in speaking the manna and so forth, did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was what? Christ. Now, does that mean that rock was physically Christ? No, of course not. But he's speaking idiomatically here that that, that, that rock that was providing here, the provision was by Jesus Christ. And Christ was hovering over them. Christ was taking care of them. He's linking that up. So the, the, the side, what you can do, to, in your notes, make, give, make yourself an assignment. Go through your Bible with a concordance and find all the places that a stone or a rock is alluded to. And you'll be astonished how those idioms are used by the Holy Spirit. The stone that the builders re rejected has become the headstone of the coroner. And that stumble, those that stumble on the rock, those that are crushed by the rock, the rock is Christ. In all those, in, it's always Jesus Christ in some surprising ways. Check it out and do it on your own. The rock was Christ is the point here. Okay, so we're down to chapter 20, verse 10. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, get this, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Big mistake. Big mistake. Who is providing the, rock, the water? Christ is, or God is. Certainly not Moses, but he's really upset. He's at the ed ed end of his tether, if you will. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. He didn't just brush up against it. He hammered it twice, doing exactly what he did a few decades earlier at Rephidim, in effect. But that's not what God told him to do. He didn't follow directions. You say, well, gee, he came close. That only counts in hand grenades and horseshoes, right? Okay. Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smoked the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. So God provided in spite of the fact that Moses did not follow directions the way God had instructed him to. Because what, what part of the problem here, probably the root problem here, is that Moses was misrepresenting God to the people. He gave the people the impression that God was angry. God was not angry. God is glad to provide their needs. That's, he's, he's in, that's the business he's in. He's in the abundance business. And Moses is giving them the impression that God is angry. And Moses is also inadvertently, I think, taking credit for it. And that's tragic. It's gonna, and here's, I'm going to get the picture here. Moses was 40 years old when he killed that Egyptian and had to flee the country. Then he spends 40 years in the Midian wilderness, tending sheep and what have you. And then the, so he's 80 when the burning bush takes place. Goes back to Egypt and goes through the whole Exodus thing. He's 80 years old. He's now led this rebellious, cantankerous group for 40 years through the wilderness. He's 120 years old. What's his dream? To, see the, to, to enter the promised land. And because he didn't follow directions, God says, you're in the penalty box. You're out of the game. We'll let you see it from the hilltop, but it's over, buddy. Did Moses ever get in the promised land? Trick question, careful. Has Moses ever been in the promised land? Yes. He was on Mount Transfiguration. Trick question for your home group. Okay. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, and to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah. Because the children of Israel strove with the Lord. Meribah means, you know, uh, striving. Strove with the Lord and was sanctified in them. The word Kadesh is added to it in the Deuteronomy equivalent passage and so forth. To distinguish it from the Meribah of uh, Exodus 17. So we have two of these things. Twice water from the rocks. At Rephidim, Exodus 17, where he strikes the rock and rock, water flows. Now, let me, before I make the, the next point, I want to make, I want to underscore something else. Obviously, the critical thing that Moses did was to misrepresent God. And this underscores something that I've come to believe very strongly. That the commandment that says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain has nothing to do with swearing or cussing or vocabulary, in my opinion. What it has to do is ambassadorship. If you're going to take on the name of the king, you better represent him fairly. And this is an example. Moses' error was to give the people the misimpression that God was angry. He wasn't angry. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 9, one of the pleas of the writer there is, Lord, that I might not steal. I don't want to be rich because I might forget you, and I don't want to be poor that I might steal, and thus take your name in vain. How can stealing take the name of it? No, because he would be misrepresented. See, when we sin, we're indicting the name of our king. Well, but there's another aspect of this that people miss. I thought I'd just share it. You can come to your conclusion. At Rephidim, that's the first occasion, the rock is struck. Christ is smitten, if you will, right? At Meribah, in Numbers 20, Moses was directed to speak unto the rock. Now, he didn't. He hit it, and he also showed the people he was angry, and that was probably the major part of his sin. But there's another subtlety here that gets missed, I think. If Moses had followed directions... These two rocks would be emblematic of the two comings of Christ. He's smitten on the first one. He's not smitten on the second. When Moses smites the rock on his own, so to speak, he blows the model. You see, I think God would have preferred the model to be there as an emblem of the first and second coming. And because of that, he's denied the pro entry into the promised land. So I'll leave that with you, and we just, uh, I want to share something else with you. I want you to imagine this scene. We talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, big event, and the time, of course, is, uh, uh, excuse me, this, the, the, this is the fall of Jerusalem under the Babylonians, not under the Romans. Time is 586 B.C. The place is Jerusalem. The event is the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian armies. We see angry soldiers as they wreck the walls and slay the people and burn the city. We can picture that. The Babylonians are tearing down Jerusalem. But here's part of the scene that most people don't realize. We see something else. We see a group of neighboring citizens as they stand on the other side and they cheer the Babylonians to ruin the city. They say, raise it, raise it. They're calling for the Babylonians, dash their little children against the stones and wipe out the Jews. Who's saying this? Who's saying this? Not the Babylonians, of course, are doing it. No, no. Who are these neighbors? They are kinsmen. They are brothers of the Jews. They're mentioned in Psalm 17. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. Who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O oh, daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. This is heavy stuff. These are cheering the atrocities. Genesis 25 gives you the clue here. In Genesis 25, these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of uh, Badanaran, and the sister of Laban, uh, to sister of Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Re Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, 
Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days were delivered, uh, to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in the womb. The first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Red, Esau. And after that came his brother out, his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, or heel catcher. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents, spending most of his time on the internet. No, I'm sorry. I didn't. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So you know the story, how Jacob you know, uh, buys the birthright and so forth. Jacob's name, Yaakov, May he or God protect. It's a play on words because Akeb means heel and Akab means deceitful, sly, insidious. So the name suggests both. He's a heel catcher on the one hand. That was the event of his birth. But he also becomes quite a conniver, quite a shifty character. I often quip that you would not buy a used car from Jacob. You know, he's a, they, they, he, it's a whole thing. He's one who grabs the heel or one who trips up is the idea. So the bitterness between Jacob and Esau, you can imagine, when Esau again and again and again in the young days gets defrauded. So when Jacob meets Esau, he's really sweating it. And they, they have a peaceful uh, uh, gathering, but that's because uh, Jacob handled it uh, very skillfully. Let's get back to numbers. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother of Israel. See, he's mentioning there, he's a brother. Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt and have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt, and behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of thy wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right nor the left until we have passed thy borders. There was a thoroughfare that was widely traveled, a very advantageous route that they were hoping to use, but they would require his permission. Edom said to him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. The children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. Very, very key event in Israel's history. If you study Edom, you'll discover, of course, it's, known, it's in Numbers 20 and 21. It'll mention again in Judges 11. Because it refused Israel passage by the king's highway. Israel was forbidden to abhor his Edomite brother. In Deuteronomy 23, despite this treatment, Israel is instructed by Moses in Deuteronomy 43 not to abhor his Edomite brother. Balaam predicted the conquest of Edom. We're going to, we're going to deal with that in the next session. This, we're going to encounter in our next session this peculiar character called Balaam. The Assyrian inscriptions show that Edom became a vassal state of Assyria after 736 B.C. And after the fall of Judah, Edom rejoiced there again in 137, similar to uh, uh, the one we read. And uh, the prophets are full of foretelling the uh, judgment on Edom because of her bitter hatred. Jeremiah 49, Lamentations 4, Ezekiel 25, 35. Most important is Obadiah. The entire book of Obadiah, it happens to be the shortest book in the Bible, but the, uh, the book of Obadiah is just focused on the... Um, destiny of Edom. Wrapping it up, the children of Israel, even the whole congregation journeyed from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. The Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron at Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter the land, into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. So Aaron pays for this too. And Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, put them on Eleazar his son, and Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and, ye, and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded. They went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments, put them up Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there on the top of the mount. 
And Moses and Eliezer came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron 30 days, even all the house of Israel. You and I will never have that bitter experience. These people had to mourn their high priest, the one that had always been their comforter, the one that had been, you know, in large measure the, uh, through all these years. We will never have to do that because our high priest will never die. He's alive forever. Now, you all know that Ammon is up to the north, Moab, Edom. We're going to go around Edom through Moab, and that's what the next session will deal with. Some very strange episodes there. For the next session, I want you to read Numbers 21 through 25. 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Five chapters. And uh, the journey into Moab, where you'll meet this strange event called the brazen serpent. And I defy you to make any sense of the brazen serpent by limiting yourself to the Old Testament alone. We'll talk about that next time, but do reflect on that. And we're also going to encounter this strange character, the prophet Balaam. He's a Mesopotamian. He's not Jewish. Yet he has the word of the Lord. He's very prominent, very strange in his behavior. He's alluded to in three different ways by Peter, Jude, and others. We'll talk about that next time. Very strange character. He also predicts the Christmas. In many, many people feel that he predicts the star of Bethlehem. We'll deal with that when we get there. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.